Um, thanks for joining us. It's, uh, it's good to see you all. Um, I was saying that's uh, Carl, my uncle, and I last played together. Uh, ooh, it would have been just over 10 years ago when my parents were both alive and uh, big day today. In, uh, we have the opportunity to chat together for you. So um, without any further ado, would you please say a big hello to uh, my uncle, the fantastic Carl Palmer. Hey, Carl. Hey, how are you doing? I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. How are you getting on? Thanks Thanks for doing this. So we've um, Since I've been in lockdown, well, we have been in lockdown. We're sort of coming out of it now, aren't we? But I've been doing these live sessions and had some friends along. So um, Brian Bennett, came along and had a chat a couple of weeks ago and I just didn't think I could uh, miss the opportunity to have um, Uncle Carl here. So um, thanks for coming over. I How enjoyed Brian Bennett. I thought that was really good. That was a good show. Yeah, it was just great. I mean, Brian's been such a uh, friend for um, a while now and such a, an influence right. on so many people. But um, how are you getting on anyway? What's been happening? Well, good, you know, I mean, basically, this is the 50th anniversary of Emerson, Lake and Palmer this year. And unfortunately, uh, so many things have had to be put on hold because of the uh, pandemic. You know, mm. it's uh, one of those things. We've had to shelve a movie that we were making with Radar, um, though it's just gone to Universal and Sony. Um, I believe they're putting in some offers or whatever. But it was to do with a concept from the Brain Salad Surgery album. There was a piece right. of music called Carnival 9. And they wanted to base the story around this Carnival 9. Uh, Daniel H. Watson was, uh, was writing it. Um, a great sci-fi writer from New York City or mm. Seattle area, actually. Um, then there was the um, documentary with BMG. I decided it was time to do a new docu documentary. We've got about 45 minutes. We were going to gather another 45 minutes, make it an hour and a half. And obviously it would be the demise of Greg and Keith and the summing up and the rounding up of all that period. Mm. So that's still underway. I just did some interviews the other week for that. Uh, that's still going. Brilliant. And then there was the Emerson Lake and Palmer show where I was going to have live footage of Greg and Keith playing with me, along with Paul and Simon in my band I'm, playing on stage. Maybe you're telling me and about we that. We were going to do... Uh, we're going to do a concert tour with Live Nation and possibly using an orchestra as well. Mm. Well, a lot of that is on uh, is on hold at the moment. Mm. Actually, a very good friend of ours was helping me with that, David Frangioni. Yep, David, fantastic. He was going to do he was going to do the technical side, as you know. David mm. owns yeah. the um, the drama magazine, Modern Drama. So um, yeah, there's a lot going on. It's still there, but you know, it's so slow. Mm. And now I'm getting requests every day for these uh, driving gigs. You know, do I want to do? A driving gig where people sit in their cars and mm. and they've started, you know, and they're working quite well. So I'll yeah. just have to look into it, see what we can do. Well, I know that you're um, I mean, you spend your life on the road playing gigs. I mean, how how many gigs a year, Carl, do you play on average? I would think now it's probably it's not, not the moment. It's have you the lowest it's ever been it's <laughs> up until this point? About Eighty to ninety. Yeah. We norm. I never get more than about one hundred and forty-seven. That's when I'm like, like really sort of like pushing the boat out a bit too far, I would say. But yeah. I would say about 90 concerts a year mm. is what we do. Yeah. And that would be really all with the band. I mean, I don't do drum clinics anymore. I mean, I basically do live concerts. And we're talking about maybe two six-week tours of America each year, South mm. America every mm. other year. Japan, Asia, every other year. It might even be longer now in Japan. Mm. <laughs> we might not go for the last time. Um, it's about 90 a year. That's yeah. about it. It's enough for me, to tell you the truth. Yeah. And, um, I mean, we were just talking about COVID-19 earlier on and the fact that how, how it's decimated the industry. But you just mentioned there about playing uh, drive-in concerts. I mean, I don't think that's yeah. anything which was really caught on in the UK. But, I mean, I know that, you know, majority of your work is in the US, I think so. Yes. Is that something that's going to be happening? Do you think next year for you? Well, it's all, it's um, it started. Um, it, there's a concert going on with some country and western artists in June this mm. year, the end of June in America. Drive in. What it is? It's 300 cars, and you pay per car. So in a car, you could have four people or five people, mm. and they've got the technology sorted out where they can have the sound come into the car via the digi radio. Mm. You'll have the sound coming off the stage. And, you know, that's what it will be. And they've started. They, they had one in Denmark yeah. about a month ago. And they, believe it or not, 
um, six weeks ago, they had one in um, Rio de Janeiro, believe right. it or not, which they shouldn't have done. Well, they're having a pretty um, hard time with the COVID, yeah, aren't they? I think. Yeah. yeah. A friend of mine, Steve Altick, who's the big promoter down there, said they'd had it, and it was quite, it was quite popular. You know, I mean, if this is the only way concerts can happen, then that's the way it will be. You know, mm. I think it'd be a long time before we get back to the. Uh, to play in those theatres where everyone is sitting side by side. Mm. I think that's a long way off. It's a shame, really, but uh, um, it's just interesting for me, you know, at my age now, just watching how the business changes and changes. And really, America is the only place that's got these outdoor venues where you can get about 3,000 people under a marquee, which yeah. will probably only be a 1,000 now. And you could get 10,000 people on the grass, mm. which will probably mm. only be 4,000 now. But those venues do exist. Mm. So mm. who knows what will happen? Um, I'll just have to see. I've got nothing in the book this year at all now. We've taken everything out. Mm. There is a, a European mm. tour in September. I don't think that's going to happen. We've kept it there. We'll see how it goes. But uh, start next year here in uh, the UK, April. Yeah, I saw the advert for the uh, for the tour that you've got coming up in Europe. Do you think yeah. you'll do anything uh, live streaming wise with the band? Will you do any live stream concerts? Is that anything that you've looked yeah. at? I've been asked uh, by the agents that I use in America if they can we can sort out some streaming. Mm. Yeah, I suppose it really depends on how good the. Uh, the technical side of it is and how good the quality is you know Variable. it's always down to that at the end of the day some of them are really good as you know some sounds aren't so great it depends on the venue and what's being set up but i'll definitely look into that for sure yeah okay well let's go back to the very start and uh, somebody very close to both of us um, wanted to ask well ask me to ask you a question and this is back to um, Silvercroft Avenue. Do you remember? Uh -huh. Do you remember the school board man coming around to the house because I think somebody actually wasn't at school because they were so busy playing gigs, <laughs> hiding behind a chimney, I gather. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was on the roof with my dad. We were doing some repairs, and uh, I did hide behind the chimney. That was that was okay because I was well out of the way, you know. Um, I do remember that. I think the time when it was really bad was I used to play truant quite a lot because I used to try and get home from school for yeah. lunch, um, which I didn't have. But I used to watch a program called Lunchbox. Oh, and yeah. It had the Jerry yeah, Allen yeah. trio. And one of my favorite drummers from Birmingham used to play on there, Lionel Rubin. So I used to whiz home to see that. And, you know, I used to kind of forget to go back, you know, at times. <laughs> and then I realized once I had the milk round at school, I realized that once I'd taken the register in my class where mm. I was, and then I did the milk round, they would expect me to go to the next class. The next period would always be in another room. And that's when I would hop over the fence. And uh, nice. I do recall going to Grove Lane Park and... Um, uh, by the swimming baths there and mm. uh, I, I was laying on the grass thinking shall I go home no it's a bit early I'll go home just in time to see lunchbox and then I'll stay and practice and I do recall a guy in a suit and a briefcase walking towards me rather quickly and mm. uh I sort of stood up and off I went. Yes, it was. Uh, I definitely did the road runner on him. You know? <laughs> well, I could imagine um, my my grandfather um, actually probably giving him what for at the time, because <laughs> uh, yeah, he yeah. he was super supportive. So, what was your um, what was your first gig um, then my around that time? Gig, but, oh, my first gig. First um, band. Uh, oh was at St. Mary's Ballroom. It was an Irish dance, mm. and I was playing mm. just the snare drum, wearing a kilt, and it was just an accordion player called Matt, who was really good at, well, I, I thought he was really good at the time. I mean, mm. I was, what, 11, so how would I know? And uh, it was all going really well, and we were both in kilts, but it was an Irish dance, so it's slightly confusing. Yeah. Um, St. Mary's Church Hall, and the women would sit down one side and the men would sit down the other. No mm. alcohol, mm. only tea and biscuits at half time. Very and Matt good. and I would be playing away on stage. And I was doing really well until he got to a, a waltz. And uh, mm. I'd only just learnt to play in four fours. So I, <laughs> I was kind of, uh, I was struggling a bit. But anyway, that was the first gig, yeah. Wow. And, who, and who, would you, who was your first influences? Because I think Buddy Rich was figured quite highly um, over the years, I think, but I would think after seeing the film Drum Crazy, my mm. dad took me to see it 
uh, one Sunday afternoon. Um, I th- Jimmy didn't come with us. That's your dad. Yeah, he yeah. didn't come with us. He was somewhere else. And uh, dad and I went, and it was on the Soho Road. It's no longer a, an Odeon cinema. Mm-hmm. And we saw the sort of... Um, four o'clock in Sunday afternoon. It was actually called Drum Crazy mm. in Europe, but the actual film was known in America as the Gene Krupa story. And I saw that film with him and I was just blown away, you know. And, uh, you know, I never take it for granted now when you hear young people say, oh, I really want to do this. I really need to do this. Or I've seen something and you get influenced. Let's say it's the light bulb moment that everyone gets. Well, yeah. that was the light bulb moment for me. And I, I remember you. coming out of the cinema and saying to dad listen he said what did you think of that i said i really want to do that i really do Mm -hmm. he said you sure i said no i said maybe we could go back and see it again he said maybe we can yeah i'll see anyway the next day he bought me the album the soundtrack Mm -hmm. which i've still got actually i've still got that album it's a vinyl obviously and uh I've walked down that road ever since, never turned back. No. Well, always, I've been talking on these live chats, actually, about that moment, that light bulb moment when, you know, guys got into drumming. And I know a lot of people mention um, Ringo Starr on the Ed Sullivan show. You know, you look at Vinnie Caliuta, yeah. Greg Bissonette. And um, I'm, not, I'm not ashamed to admit that my light bulb, and um, I'm very proud to admit, actually, my light bulb moment was watching you play on a VHS video in 1977 at the Montreal Olympic Stadium. And I think my, my brother Paul bought my dad Jimmy that, uh, that VHS video as a, as a Christmas present. And I think that was the moment. And it had the big orchestra. And, and I believe that Peter Erskine's wife was playing in the orchestra on that concert. I mean, she was probably a cellist, I believe. Yes, she's an Oriental lady, isn't yes, she, if I recall. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I believe. She, well, I don't think she was um, Mrs. Erskine then, but I no. think they, they, they were involved. Right. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, mm-hmm. great orchestra, great young players. You know, really enjoyable. Yeah, that really was enjoyed. That was the moment um, for me. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not that. I mean, I don't mean to be to be too critical, but it's very difficult playing with string players with violin players, you know, mm. or any string players, because they're very late on that beat, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. like brass where they hit the notes. The yeah. string players soaring. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. So I found that with the ERP music a bit difficult, but what a great challenge. And uh, they were just great players. So we had a lovely time. But I think with, with three musicians, I mean, that's a bit of a difference, isn't it? Going for a huge orchestra um, from just three musicians who are agile and play together so often. So yeah. was, was there a lot of rehearsing yeah. that went into that? Yeah, an incredible amount of rehearsal. And Godfrey mm. Salmon was the conductor, and he did a great job. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the orchestra was handpicked. They came from all over America and Canada. Mm. Um, it, it was it was a great thing to do, and it went really well, and it lasted for three weeks. Yeah. And then we had to play yeah. three weeks as a trio to put the book straight, you know, because um, <laughs> it, it lost money, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. I mean, it didn't actually lose money long term because there was a video, there was an album, mm. uh, you know, and there was yeah. merchandise and things. But uh, what a great experience. I mean, it's something... Um, you know, when you play in the Olympic Stadium Montreal in the winter mm. and you make one of the first mm. rock and roll videos of the guys walking in the snow and then oh, playing the Fanfare of the Common, common man. man. And then the next summer, you're playing in there with a 60-piece orchestra plus choir. I mean, quite a fulfilling period. Yeah. Would you say that that was, is that the high, was that the <laughs> highlight with the ELP, would you say? Or was that your favourite moment with the ELP? There's lots of highlights, but was that your favourite, your biggest moment, would you say? <laughs> I would mm. say, I mean, obviously that was a big moment. And California Jam, when there were like 120,000 people, mm. that was another big moment. There's been many of them. But to tell you the truth, the one that always um, sticks in my mind, and not because I played well, I was kind of disappointed with my playing that night. And I remember kicking mm. some drum cases and stuff in a bit of a temper, which I don't normally do. <laughs> and that's the only time I could ever remember doing it. Mm. But the concert that mm. sticks in my mind was the first time we played at Carnegie Hall. Um, I just couldn't believe that. I think it's because of, you'd already got the album by Dave Brubeck, the live at Carnegie Hall, Castilian Drums, and I was just kind of, all oh, kind of fluttering, you know. And, uh, I thought, <laughs> wow, you know, this yeah. is a great place to play. And uh, Carnegie Hall itself is such an incredible sound, yeah. you know. Um, that one stays in my mind. Yeah, and I think it was, well, it was you originally that recommended that I went to for lessons with Joe Morello, 
And so out of the two drummers, Buddy Rich and Joe Morello, I mean, they were huge influences. Um, how Completely different. You've got one who's a big band drummer, which is Buddy Rich, and uh, Joe Morello, who thought he was a big band drummer, but played in a small group. Yeah. And I like the way Joe played in the small group because he was quite aggressive, tasteful, yeah. mm. but loud. And, uh, you know, he had, um, he just had a, a lovely musical flow about it. Castilian drums being one, mm. which is a, that five mm. drum solo from Carnegie Hall is just sensational. The drum solo in Take Five, which was the first million million dollar selling jazz album, my very first jazz album I ever bought, Time Out by Dave Brubeck. Yeah. Big influences. So that was a big influence. And then the, the Buddy Rich album, this one's for Basie which mm. is uh, the orchestrations on the album, this one's for Basie, were done by Marty uh, Page. And that's the father of David, David Page. David Page, Toto. Toto, yeah. So was that, I, I didn't know that at the time because Toto mm. didn't exist, but that album, um, this one's for Basie, had a track called Jumping at the Woodside. Yeah. And what's the solo might sound a little old-fashioned now, it just, <laughs> it just mm. blew me away. And that was an album given to me, by the way, by Bruce Gaylor, who I believe Brian Bennett talked about last week. Well, I mentioned the teacher. I, yeah, well, I yeah. mentioned that to Brian, and he was uh, he remembers really clearly you going for lessons with uh, Bruce Gaylor. And uh, I think yeah. he was saying he was a pit drummer originally, Bruce, Bruce Gaylor. Um, he was, yes. He didn't play a lot. He played it with the King brothers, who were like a, a trio of a sort of Irish singers who were very good sort of a harmony type of group, which he mm. played with. And he basically, he didn't do the work that somebody like Kenny Clare did mm. or Ronnie Verrill. He never got into that area, but mm. he was always so respected. And uh, when my dad, your dad's dad, mm. Alan, mm. Got, wanted to try and get me lessons. Mm. Um, Kenny Clare was who we went after. Oh, and uh, yeah, we yeah, got yeah. hold of Kenny Clare, and um, I, I just couldn't believe Kenny Clare when I saw him play at London mm. Palladium. I get the old flash of him playing uh, in the pit Sunday night at the London Palladium on the television, black and white. And I was going, yeah, can we get him. Can we get him? And, uh, yeah, and yeah. Uh, Dad found him. He found him. I, mm. you know, and Kenny was such a lovely man. He said, there's one guy. I can't do it. Too busy. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. one guy. Why don't you send him down to London once a week? So I travelled down from mm -hmm. Birmingham. How old were you? How old were you then? Uh, um, Twelve and a half, thirteen. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And uh, I'd go straight to. Uh, I'd go. It was into Paddington then. I'd get the taxi straight over to Denman Street, Boozy and Hawks. I'd meet Bruce in the shop. We'd have a cup of tea or some breakfast next door. Straight down and do an hour and a half. And then the instructions was, I get in a taxi immediately, hail one, and straight to the railway station, and no messing about. And of course, that's what I did, and I loved it, you know. And, uh, Bruce Gaylor was just an amazing teacher. Mm. He was, you know, some guys are great players, and some guys are great players and great teachers. Mm. He was both. He just never played, but mm. he was a sensational player. And uh, I thank Kenny Clare for that, and I do miss him dearly. Yeah. And incidentally, mm. I want you to know that um, you might not know, but in Leytonstone, where Kenny Clare is from, I just discovered the other day, in 104 Richmond Road, where Kenny, I believe he lived or was born, there's mm. now a blue plaque above the door. Oh, great. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Fantastic. Because you have to... He was our greatest mm. drummer ever that yeah, we produced, you know. Really, yeah, Until yeah. Until we yeah. Well, that's till we came along. You well, know. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, we've, we've changed things now. <laughs> Shake it up. Well, I was um, my friend Neil. Do you, my friend Neil Wilkinson always speaks about Kenny Clare, um, and Neil obviously a fine, fine session player in London, and uh, he actually owns Kenny Clare's old snare drum, which he used, which was an old Ludwig uh, bronze shell. I think it was a 401, they call it, a really particularly rare snare drum, and he's got that drum. Yeah. And in fact, Brian Bennett, when we spoke together a couple of weeks ago, he was talking about that snare drum and talking about the way he used to tune the drum, and he was saying that he detuned one of the lugs to basically yeah, yeah. get that dry sound, which was one of the things yeah. which Neil talks about now. I think if you want to see uh, on YouTube, you get any time at all to see Kenny play his very best. Um, 1974, mm. I think it's the, it might be the Royal Albert Hall or one of those on the embankment, Queen Elizabeth Hall or whatever. Anyway, it's with Tony Bennett. Mm. 
Oh, right, he's okay. Tony Bennett. Mm. And uh, Kenny's actually playing the like, premier drums at that stage, the ones that had that extra lining which they put inside the shell, mm. which was a new uh, idea. Well, they used to have a, a regular shell and then put a complete lining uh, that you could remove inside mm. the shell, and they reckon it gave it a bigger sound. Yeah. Anyway, Kenny's playing White Marine Pearl premier drums in the orchestra backing Tony Bennett, and he wow. plays sensational i think i've seen some of the footage of that it's on on youtube as well did yeah. you say that yeah there's a lot of it Fantastic. yeah yeah, yeah. Um, really good so i'm just looking here there's a load of questions so david chase who uh comes to these chats quite often just saying i think it's more of a statement really but uh, my first exposure to your music was asia then i discovered elp i was barely a teen thanks for the inspiration of my youth and beyond so the question is um was progressive drumming challenging back when ELP first formed? And what was your inspiration, um, or who was your inspiration as a young drummer? I think we've probably just covered that one. But um, yeah, was pro uh, progressive drumming challenging when you first formed ELP? It kind of was, it was in a way and it wasn't because I always wanted to be, um, I always wanted to be in, in, in a rock band, but I've always had a quite uh, a love for classical music. Uh, mm. And a lot of the classical composers, you know, Shostakovich, Stravinsky, yeah. Bartok. And I've, oh, I always enjoyed uh, Jacques Lucier because he used to play Bach mm. and in a very controlled manner in a trio. And I always thought if I could get into a band that plays classical adaptations, but in a modern contemporary way with the latest technology, mm. I, I would be, that would be me if I could mm. ever find that. And of course, I did find that with uh, with Keith Emerson. Mm. He had the same idea. He was already doing it with the nice. So for me, it wasn't challenging. It was really rewarding. I was ready for it, and I was mm. waiting for it, you mm. know. And uh, the only thing I ever did was I used to buy the mini scores in in Boozy and Hawk. So I'd listen to the recording of pictures at an exhibition, but I'd have the mini score as well. And if there's something I wanted to play that the percussion section played. I could, I've got it there for a reference. I'll be honest with you, I never did. I just made up my own stuff as I went because it was better as far as I was concerned. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, it wasn't that challenging. It was really um, incredibly rewarding, incredibly yeah. rewarding. And it suited, uh, it suited the makeup of the family because if you think about it, the grandfather was a classical musician. Uh, who, he taught at the Royal Academy, mm -hmm. played violin. Yeah. His brother was a drummer. Yeah, Cyril. Yeah, Cyril yeah, was a yeah, yeah. So I had the, the classical thing, the jazz thing, and my first jazz record was Time Out, the Dave Brubeck, yeah. and that had all that 5 4 stuff on yeah. it there, you know, Rondo Alatur, you know. I thought, oh, this was me. How could I put those two things together? Was that your idea to cover that with ELP? Did, yes, we did, yeah. yeah. I mean, ELP was, was perfect for me. Was that your idea? Was that. Sorry. No, I was just yeah, say, was that probably was the best musician that I've ever worked with, mm. you know, from the point of view of having a synergy mm. that was really, really on it. Yeah. With me. Yeah. There was definitely I mean that was a that was just the chemistry, wasn't it? With with you three together. That was a thing. And it was just the yeah. perf the perfect chemistry. Um yeah. which um Kind of leads me to another question actually, which has just occurred to me. I mean, certainly now in the modern world of pop. The idea is that you are totally precise and playing exactly the same thing night after night. With ALP, yes. did you have the opportunity? Did you find that the music evolved as a tour went on, or did you stick very strictly to the same parts from beginning to the end of the tour? We had we had parts, say for Tarkas or pictures at an exhibition, were, which were worked out exactly, mm. and we play the same every mm. night. The same drum fill, it would be the same. Mm. But that might lead mm. into a section where there's a keyboard solo, and that keyboard solo could go 32 bars, 16 bars, really depended on key. That was the moment for the improvisation and every man to his own. Get in there and do what you can do and make this sound as mm. eventful as possible. So there was always the areas, but they were heavily disguised by proper orchestrations, which were played night after night religiously. Okay. So we had the we had the freedom, but the structure was always very sound. That's good. I mean, I think having that freedom within the music to allow things to evolve, I think, is important. I mean, I, I always loved it yeah. with Buddy that he never approached. You listen to the same 
track on a Buddy Rich record and you'd play, you know, the eight bar break different on each one, which always was amazing. <laughs> he was, he was great. Yeah. And, uh, oh, yeah, I know exactly what you were yeah. And I think you ended up playing with um, Buddy's big band in you at, at one point. Well, tell us about that. Yeah, <laughs> I did. Uh, well, I was in a Ronnie Scott's club. Um, well, there's twice, actually. We were in Ronnie Scott's club. I was with Keith and... Um, um, I'd said hello to Buddy because we'd been friends since I was mm. about 15, 16. Mm. And um, uh, he was kind of bantering whether we should get up and play. And I said, well, you know, yeah, Keith, do you want to come and play? Keith didn't want to do it. So he said, mm. no, we said, we'll watch you. We were just starting to eat, actually. Yeah. So that was the problem. So mm. anyway, um, that was the first time. I actually didn't play, but that was the first time I got the invite. And then I think it was back sort of round about, I don't know, 83 or something like that. Anyway, he was at Ronnie Scott's and uh, he, he had come to the end of the evening and the end of the week's performance, I believe. And he said, Carl, would you like to come up and play? I said, um, yeah, mm -hmm. of course. And uh, he had his uh, 1947 Radio Kings. It's really brave. So, <laughs> yeah, so I got up there and... Uh, he said, don't move anything, don't touch anything, you know, because no. I, I tried to move the stuff. But in actual fact, Buddy always used to have his drums set up on a piece of plywood, very thin, no. with some like little nails and things holding things in place. Mm -hmm. So I got there and uh, he said, what do you want to play? So I quickly thought to myself, I'm not going to mention anything. I said, whatever you want me to play, I'll play. Mm -hmm. So he said, Shawnee. Yeah. I don't know, Shawnee. That's, that's quite Where's up, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, he said, Where's he said, you'll be all right. I said, that, he said and then his first yeah, gag was, hey, everyone, have you ever seen a band rehearse before? Well, you're <laughs> to see it now. So, and there I was. And he counted me in, and uh, Steve Marcus, who was mm. right next to me, just turned his parts. I could see a few of the hits. Yeah. I could get a shot at it. My eyesight was better then. <laughs> and uh, we had a, had a great time and a little bit of a drum break. It ended up on the anthology album mm. that I've got. It's on there. And, uh, uh, you know, he was lovely, but he was lovely. And, uh, yeah, that was the only time I actually played. And that recording, believe it or not, was given to me many years after by there's an underground sort of drumming sort of fraternity or I don't know what they are, but a guy came up to me one day and he said, it was on cassette. He said, I'm going to give you a, a cassette of you playing with Buddy Rich, but you you don't know who you got it from and you've never seen me. Mm. And I looked at this guy, who are you? Mm. Anyway, he gave me this thing and uh, I took it back, played it as in the days of cassettes. I had a cassette with me, obviously a Walkman or whatever it was at the time, and played it. I thought, wow, it was recorded on stereo mics, so yeah. it wasn't bad. So I, um, I took it into, um, into a, one of those forensic sound labs at the time where you could spot wipe off sounds and clean yeah. it up. But it's the kind of place the police use, you know, mm. for identifying extraneous noises in the background. Cleaned it all up. I gave Kathy a call and said, Kathy, you won't believe I've got this recording. It's as clean as it will ever be. I'll send you a copy. Have a listen. I'd like to put it on an anthology album. What do you think? She said, oh, yeah, go ahead. Send it me anyway. So I did. Sent it over to Kathy. She said, fine. And that was it. And that's the only real time um, that I ever had. A, it's the only recording ever mm -hmm. of being playing with his band. I mean, I spent a lot of time with him, whether it was on the bus going out to Long Island or the time I sent a limousine for him uh, to pick him up, to bring him to Madison Square Gardens to watch us play. Wow. Or when he came round to my house here in Hertfordshire for dinner. And then I took him back in uh, my Bentley, which I had at the time, which yeah. he just wanted to go in, yeah. <laughs> Bentley Flying Spur. Yeah, I yeah. wanted to use the uh, uh, the cricket car, the Mercedes Sports I had, but he yeah. wanted to use going the Bentley. So he was great. He was a lovely man, yeah. lovely man, and really good for me, really good for me. Didn't learn a lot from him, I'll be mm. honest. Only what mm. I could watch and see. Uh, when we played together a couple of times, I mean, but he plays and you just have to watch, just like you watch a video of him. He, he can't tell you what, he couldn't tell you what to do or what you were doing wrong. It wasn't like that with him, you know. Lovely man though, lovely man. I, mean, I, was, I was really proud when I heard an interview that he had, um, had done and it was just a really rough recording and he said yeah for me um, the greatest drummers in the world today were um, yeah I love Steve Gadd that's Steve Stevie Gadd he's a great player and I love Carl Palmer 
And he mentioned um, one other person. I can't remember who that was now, but he, but it was lovely that he, he name checked you. So to get up and play with the Buddy Rich Big Band, I mean, for the average person is probably would be the most imit- intimidating experience ever. I mean, did you not feel nervous getting up there? Did you, feel, did you doubt yourself at all? I mean, musicians. I, I, did, I mean, I, as you probably know, I mean, I've talked about it before, you know, I, I love to watch big band drummers uh, and I like big band music. I've never really wanted to play it as a profession myself all Mm. of the time. You know, it's not something that's attracted me. I've enjoyed that sort of more contemporary sort of rock music type of thing. Mm. But I understand the challenge. I've always looked up to these players and they've always been part of my life. So to do that Mm. was like huge, you know. What I really wanted though, was more was to, to was to meet the man, understand him, and try and find out where this stuff comes from, why he's so great, and what did he do? And uh, mm. I just read a new book the other day uh, that somebody gave me about Buddy Rich, and uh, you know, mm. this chap was saying, you know, that Buddy actually practiced, and I never saw him practice, but mm. apparently he, he did he did practice not yeah. a lot, but he did practice before he went on. Mm. He did warm up. I never saw that ever. Mm. Um, I went out um, on a bus with him to Long Island, yeah. and it was the Louis Belson Orchestra, the Buddy Rich Orchestra, and I think a, a local Long Island drummer called Bob Miller. I can't remember. Anyway, it was yeah. the three of them. And when we got there, um, Louis Belson was playing, and uh, Buddy was, you know, they were setting up his drums and things, and. Buddy and Louie got on incredibly well, and Buddy was at the side of the stage hissing, going, sss, sss. <laughs> and Louis was smiling, and they, they were very close. They yeah. were very close. I mean, uh, yeah, when they came off, it was so many hugs and kisses, you just couldn't believe it. Yeah. And uh, then Buddy played, and uh, he was just the greatest, you know. Mm. So I, I was very nice of him to, to take me out on the band bus. Mm. He gave me the tour of Manhattan, the lecture about all the theatres and what they were historically. And, you know, in his day, you know, this, oh, you should go and see Gene Krupa then. I go, you know, this and that. And it was lovely. Anyway, coming back from that gig on the bus, I said to him, how about dinner then? We could get something to eat. We could go to the Carnegie or we could go, there's a load of the stage, one of those delis, because he only lived around the corner, mm. uh, Lincoln Plaza by the, by the park. Yeah. Oh, he said, no, I'm fine. He said, I- I've, got, I- I've got something to eat. So I said, no, let me, I said, let me do it. You brought me out. Let, let me take it for dinner. He said, no, I'm fine, Carl, honestly. And uh, it was, uh, it was a, one of the sad moments, actually, because um, I might have mentioned this in my autobiography that's sort of going to come out later this year or probably possibly for Christmas. But as I said that to him, he said, no, I'm fine, I'm okay. He reached under his seat and he pulled out a carton of milk that was already opened, a small carton of milk. And then he pulled out a brown bag mm-hmm. and he opened it up and there was like a, a Danish pastry or something in there. It looked like somebody had sat on it, you know. Mm-hmm. And he said, I'm fine. And I said, but, you know, he said, no, no. He said, I'm used to eating like this. He said, I'm fine, honestly. Mm-hmm. And I realized that uh, that, was him, that was him being buddy and that's the way he'd been all of his life, you know. Yeah. He was a real road rat. Mm-hmm. He'd lived on the road from, you know, two years old and uh, that's what it was all about. And it wasn't as if uh, he wanted to go for dinner. It's not that he wanted to do that. He just wanted to get home. He was staying in his own apartment that night, which is probably a rarity anyway. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I got it. I got it. But uh, I felt I had to offer. And uh, that was the kind of relationship we had. It was, it was pretty cool. And uh, I've had a great relationship with uh, Kathy and Greg Potter over the years as well. You know, that's that's been pretty solid. So well, it's, just, it's been a nice, uh, nice environment to be part of. Yeah, well, I was going to say about Buddy, I mean, you had the challenge we spoke about with, with Emerson, Lake and Palmer carrying an orchestra with you and the financial limitations. And, you know, at the time, ELP was huge. But Buddy Rich was going, was carrying an orchestra and a 17, 18 piece orchestra around with him for years and years and years playing in relatively small venues. So the financial challenges um, that he must have faced in order to do that were pretty, pretty huge, I'd have thought. Yeah, I mean, I asked, you know, I, I mean, I'll be very honest mm. with you. I did ask. I said, can you tell me how you run a big band, how that's done? Because I only knew about rock bands and how you do that. Mm. And uh, when I asked that question, we hadn't gone out with an orchestra. So, I, you know, I didn't have that experience. But I said, how do you run a big band? How's the, how the, the wage is done? How do you do the expenses? Who books this? How's that done? And he just looked at me and he said, I play drums. Mm. That's what I do. 
Yeah. I yeah. said, oh, okay. I said, I was just, just, you know, interested. He said, mm. I play drums. And mm. that was it. And that was fine. You know, listen, I, I think, um, you know, he did such a great job and was such a, a great musician. Mm. If he didn't want to get involved with the arrangements and someone else did it for him, understandable, mm. you know, because mm. uh, he made up for it in every other way possible you know yeah, so no, there you go so so moving on then and um, there was then was asia in the 80s now around that time i mean i had lots of heroes drummers around that time and asia obviously was was a big part of my life but um toto were around at that time as well and i was a big you know a, a drummers worldwide huge jeff Picaro's fans yes. did, did you ever Very- did you ever met, meet jeff no, I mean, I played oh. with Steve Lukather a couple of times on Asia tracks way back when yeah. in Los Angeles. Yeah, we did that. But no, I never met uh, Picaro, never, oh, never no. met him. Um, mm. I knew his dad vaguely, met him mm. once. He didn't know who I was at the time. Mm. Um, but no, I never met him, never. Oh. But a great drummer. I mean, you know, one of those all-time sort of session greats taking off his dad who was a session great. Yeah, really. uh, yeah lovely. Great and, plan. and I remember, uh, Steve Picaro said that one of his ter- big moments in his life was seeing Keith Emerson play with ELP. Um, Steve Picaro being the keyboard player, of course, with them um, Toto, who is uh, you know, st- still 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 was still with the band until uh, they yeah, finished yeah. recently. So yeah. let's have a look at some more questions here. Um, so. Um, Ooh, where are okay yeah here's one from richard he's asking carl you're a very physical player how do you stay in shape sorry i know i missed no, that you no. on me. So, sorry. Richard, so richard harris is saying here carl you're a very physical player how do you stay in shape well with great difficulty i will tell you that <laughs> Um, one of the problems I have is as I've got older, I can't change the way I play. Mm. And if I did, I would be sort of cheating the public, as it were, and mm. cheating myself, which is even worse. Um, I mean, I do what I can. You know, uh, I've been a vegan for about eight years. Mm. Um, I'm very mm. careful um, about what I do exercise wise. I've been running four times this week. You know, mm. I do sit ups, I play every day. Uh, I mean, to prove it, you know. I've got my pad right here. You beautiful, know. beautiful, yeah. You know, I'm ready to go all the time. Yeah. Um, it, it's, you know, it's difficult really, but it's about not taking a lot of drugs. It's about not drinking a lot. It's about eating well, sleeping well. Mm-hmm. And if you're in it for the long haul, you realize that all of those things will add up over a long period of time. Mm-hmm. And they've stood me in good stead. You know, I mm-hmm. still feel like really good and I really want to play all the time. I've just got um, I've just got a lot of energy and John Wetton used to always say, Carly said, you make coffee nervous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, my, that's the way it is. I'm just, I, I'm sort of naturally hyper, you know. Well, my friend Mark Mondesi, he was saying, oh, I played a drumming show with them, Carl in Germany. And he said okay. he's amazing. He said he, he was playing like he was going to get arrested. He was playing like it was his... <laughs> <laughs> that was his expression. <laughs> so, it's always a, going to be the last time, is it? So you've got to give it everything you've got. You know, that's how I look at it. Yeah. And uh, I remember playing at the Elizabeth... Uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth Hall, is it? For Rhythm Magazine. There was mm. that drummer event they used to have. And uh, Steve Smith was on the same bill. And he came to the sound check. I didn't know he was there. And I was playing, and he said, "Carl, this is one of the first times I'd ever seen him." He said, "Carl, leave some for the show." Said, <laughs> yeah. I've got plenty for the show. I said, "I'm just warming up." I said, "That's what I do," you know. Um, and he's become a good friend over the years, uh, as you can imagine. In 2017, I played about 47 concerts with Steve when he was in Journey at the time, and mm, Asia was mm. the support. Uh, but mean, he was a great guy. Great yeah, guy. yeah, no. Uh, okay, <laughs> let's just go with another question here. <laughs> From um, Tanya, a question for Carl. Um, when you did the 1977 video, Fanfare for the Common Man, um, were you guys as cold as it looked? It seems free- it seemed freezing. Also, I saw a very recent comment on YouTube. Um, ELP, they were playing in quarantine before it was cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, to be honest, that was one of the first rock videos, to be honest with you. And mm. uh, that idea of all pl- of walking in the snow to the stage and playing mm. uh, was a great idea at the time until you got out there, you know, when it's about, you know, sort of 10 degrees below or whatever, and you, you are freezing off, you know, like you would not believe. 
uh, was okay. So what we did, because we realized it was so cold, we restricted it to um, uh, one shoot, a sort of walking to the stage, mm. and then four shoots, one all the way through on the drums, one all the way through on the bass, one all the way through on the keyboards, and then one all the way through all together. And yeah. we said, if you haven't got it after that, we're not doing it. <laughs> yeah, bad luck. And, uh, you know, we well, I think you can see the you can see the breathing, the breaths. You yeah. know, it was so cold. You yeah. know, um, yeah. it was very cold. Yeah, it was really cold. Oh. But we were kind of used to the cold, but not used to outside playing in it. You know, it was it was weird. I it was playback, by the way. We mm. we, we were miming. Mm, I was going to say, because I, I struggle to play when I'm cold. I can't play in a cold. In the it's room. Very, it was very difficult. I mean, there was lots of bowls of soup and hot dogs and burgers and things flying, <laughs> flying around. <laughs> so, um, okay. So just to wrap this thing up very shortly, actually, well, we've been going for 45 minutes. Um, are there any other questions here that are um, any good questions? Someone asked me, actually, and someone sent me a message and said, um, I, I know the answer to this one. But someone asked me, whatever happened to that stainless steel drum kit that you used with the LP? Well, it's actually with a gentleman called David Frangioni, who owns Modern Drummer. He's got a museum which he's never quite opened yet. It's in Florida. Mm. And he also put, um, produced a book called Crash, which mm. I put the forward for. And that um, itemizes all of these great drum sets through the history of rock, you know, from Kiss to, to, to Rush to ELP to whoever. And mm. David's now got it. Um, but between David and myself, it did go via Ringo Starr uh, because we thought that um, Ringo's son was going to be using it, but he never did. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. And then Ringo ended up selling it, and that was it, and, mm. and David bought it. Yeah. Wasn't there a funny story with um, Ringo Starr when he said to you, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. And you said, well, what have you got? <laughs> said, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we were going to... Um, I had to call up the office or Ringo's um, PA or whoever it was when we did the, um, was it 2012, um, the prog rock show here in London mm. at uh, the park here over in East London. We were, it was the first time ELP had played in years and we were going to play a concert. It was the last concert we played and we started talking about why don't we bring all the retro equipment back. So I called up and said, look, I might want this drum set back. Could I rent it back for the day or can I work out a deal with you or whatever? And because uh, I think they got all excited that I was going to use it. <laughs> but uh, thank God uh, we dropped it. And uh, I used my Ludwig drum set, the uh, 100th anniversary drum set that Ludwig made for yeah. me. So, um, yeah, I, I didn't want the drum set back. It's, you know, it's nothing that I use or play these days. So there you go. But it was a great set. I don't think anyone could have lifted the bass drum on that drum set. Well, they could, they actually. <laughs> it took two people, two people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you're not wearing, gonna... body, wearing body belts. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to put it in the back of my car and bring it along to the gig for you. That's for sure. Um, um, so, oh, someone we know very, very well is here. Um, Uncle Steve, Brother Steve. Um, maybe see. maybe Carl could say something about his drum and percussion teachers. Yeah, Tommy Cunliffe, Lionel Rubin and James Blades. Well, I can, yes. Tommy Cunliffe was the very first teacher. Very first teacher. James Blades was one of the first guys that I had in... Um, in London, along mm. with Gilbert Webster from the Guild Hall. And this here is the only real, and I thank Steve for getting it back, this is the only real Palmer drum alive that's going and working and up and running. It's, it's missing something. Um, I'll tell you about that in a minute. But this drum was played by Dad. Yeah. Your dad's dad. Mm. My dad. Mm. It was played by me. It was played by Steve. And... Uh, this is the drum that you will end up getting and you'll have to keep because this is the only real oh. Palmer drum. Now, this used to be part of a set. Yes. Stephen yes. used it for teaching. I believe he gave it to some uh, some guys at a school or whatever to use. Mm -hmm. They trashed it. One day I said to Steve, where is the, the drum set? You know, the Rogers drum set, you know, this red sort of spark or crack or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, he said, uh, it's at a school. He said, I, I could probably get it back. So I said, see if you can. Anyway, Steve tried, and he found the only thing that there was kind of in one piece um, was this, the snare drum, which is the most important part. Anyway, it came Beautiful. back without the snare release. Can you hold it? Can you hold it up closer to the camera there, Carl? Yeah, I've got yeah. a brand new snare release. Oh, for it. beautiful. 
yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and all it's missing, all it's missing now, and you can't get it till I get it, mm. is a, a Rogers badge, the scroll badge. Mm. Now, I've got one. Yep. But this is an English Rogers made here in England, not an American Rogers. So the American Rogers had the scroll going slightly upwards. The English Rogers, they were always straight. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, the yeah, 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 That's yeah, the yeah. only diff way you can tell the difference. Very you good. see adverts for Rogers drums today, the scroll, the Rogers drum sign goes up. Anyway, oh. this is one of the original Rogers English drums from the, uh, from the 60s, and it was played by all of the family. Um, that's in immaculate condition. Uh, and that's it. And uh, it's all it's all in one piece now. And it's perfect, except it hasn't got the badge. I do have a badge, but it's the wrong one. Somebody mm. sent me a Tom Tom badge, which is slightly smaller, and I didn't want to make another hole in the shell, so I've got to wait. Oh, Once I've got amazing. that, um, then we'll pass it on to you, and you you will be the um, the. You will be the owner, and I'll be holding you out the family heirloom. <laughs> yeah, this oh. is the, well. This is the only. A real sort of um, Palmer drum left. This mm. is the uh, there was the drum set, but this is the only one, and this is it. So uh, I signed oh. it for you. So you, oh. you gave it to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's brilliant. Oh, thank you, Carl. That's amazing. So um, just another another question here, a really quick one from uh, Richard. <laughs> He's uh, saying, what was it like working with Arthur Brown? Um, it was oh. quite an experience for me at the time because I'd never been to America. So I joined Arthur mainly to go to America. And I was 18, not knowing that by the time I got to America, the single was a number one single, mm. Fire. Um, and this was this had been recorded by me mm. and Dracian Thika. Dracian Thika, I think, is the drummer that's on that recording. I've recorded it many times, but he's I think he's the one that's on it. In actual fact, we don't know. I got paid as a session player at that time. It was mm. one of the few times I ever did that, and thank God I did because I got the call. I went to America, and uh, it was during that sort of hippie period. Hey mm. Ashbury and the drugs and this and that and oh and just all those bands that you could imagine it was just chaos and uh, I really liked that psychedelic period you know it was great I couldn't understand that the the drugs and tripping and taking acid was more important than the music but it obviously mm. was to a lot of people except for me um, but it was the late sixties in America was the greatest time I ever had mm. and um, as you know last year I toured with Arthur yeah. I had Arthur come and sing with my band and uh, we, we did that uh, Royal Affair tour with Yes being the headliners Asia CPL uh, my mm. band mm. Um, the LP Legacy and John Lodge from the Moonies that was a nice bill um, and Arthur's still great he's still singing really well you know and we played Fire and Fire was a number one hit for about oh. a week in America in 1968. Did, did you so, play on that single? No, no. That, that single originally was recorded by Dracian Thika. Oh, sorry. When, no. when we actually got the tape boxes to see who played on what track, mm. uh, all we know is, is that um, the, the keyboards were the same on all tracks, which was Vincent Crane, yeah. but the boxes weren't marked. Kit Lambert, who did, was the producer, and the tape op, in those days, they never marked the boxes, so you never knew who was on what. So there was a band with Dracian Thika, Nick Graham, Same. I think it was, and Vincent Crane, and Arthur. That was the original crazy world, you know. And <laughs> yeah. it was only when uh, Dracian, um, who's dead now, unfortunately, mm -hmm. went a bit strange and wanted to go and join some sect somewhere. Um, yes, you do. <laughs> they pulled me up and said, would you come to America? And which was a bit of a thing, really. I didn't really, um, I didn't really want to do it because I thought, well, you know, it's a long way to go if I don't like it. But I wanted to see America, wanted to mm. see where all some of the best drummers had come from. Yeah. And yeah, as soon as they sent the ticket through, I was at the airport, you know. <laughs> <on the plane. laughs> Yeah, and they spent at least until recently. You were spending most of your life there, I guess. Then with the, <laughs> yeah. with the band. So, um, well, just before we finish. Yeah. Who at the moment inspires you? What, which current drummers at the moment do you love to listen to? You know, I knew that you might ask that. Yeah, you know, yeah. And I've got a, a bit of a list here. Ah. I actually put a list together of guys. One of the guys I really like is Eric Moore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eric Moore, Chris Coleman, I think is very, very cool. And there was a guy the other day called uh, Youssef Dayes. Right. I'm Yousef not familiar with D -A -Y -E -S. him. D-A-Y-E-S. Youssef Dayes. Really good. Mm -hmm. Really good. Um, 
Uh, there's a guy called Dylan Ellis mm. who plays in Tower of Power, is it, or is it um, Chicago, one of those bands? Mm. Um, there's another guy called uh, Travis Orbin. Right. Very, very cool. There's a great jazz drummer who's a little bit older, but very cool, Willie Jones II. Mm. Very, very nice player. Um, and there's a guy called... Uh, Jotan Afanador, Afanador, Jotan Afanador, really cool player, fantastic. I mean, these are I, new I think, names. Think, yeah, I mean, I, I do YouTube, you know, once a month and mm. check out all the drummers and then write down if I read something good about a drummer, I, I just have to go and find out about it and see mm. if it's true. And uh, I've got these, uh, I've got this list here of guys that I well, listen to, and they just, um, they just. Fantastic. That guy, uh, Benny Gribb, is it? He's fantastic. Oh, Benny Gribb's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. German. Yeah, that's no, really very cool. And uh, Well, I'm going to have to get that list from you and, yeah. and check some of those guys. Do you, have you heard of a drummer called um, Thomas Cremier? Tom, no. He's a French guy with like the most amazing double bass drum chops. Got uh, all this stuff. He's, one, he's one of these speed metal guys. But. Yeah, there's a guy called, there's a great metal drummer called Eloy Casagrande. Oh, yeah, yeah. Eloy Casagrande. And, you know, he's got feet to die for. I mean, they drive yeah. me mad, these guys, you know, because I hear it, and if I can't play it straight away, then yeah. I'm stuck in the room trying to make sure I'm up to speed, you know. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. that's what it is for me. I found that the, the internet and YouTube, what a great learning tool. Mm. So good, you know. It just opens up a, a ton of stuff to you. Um, there's a guy here called a a Adam Dietek. Adam Dietz. Yeah. yeah, he's great. Yeah, well, I mean, they just, they just, they keep coming. Adam uh, Beach um, is an absolute hero. He's on my top twenty list, and there's an album. With... Ronald Bruner. Oh, Ronald Bruner. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, but Adam Beach is on a fantastic album that I was listening to recently, which everyone should check out actually, with a guitarist John Schofield called oh, um, yeah. Uber Jam. Uh, it's oh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. so I'll, I'll just send you a copy of a link to that one. But if anyone's listening who's interested in that, in John Schofield, check out John Schofield with Adam Deitch. Amazing. And there you go. Yeah. And there's this, uh, there's this guy, um, uh, Achilles Presto, is it? Achilles Presto. Okay. Presto. Mm. Um, is he a metal guy? Or? It's, a, it's like um, this guy kind of does handstands on his drum stool and <laughs> body flips and stuff but plays like you would not believe. I mean, he's just sensational. Um, yeah, they drive me mad, you know, because the standard yeah. is so high today, you mm. know. It is ridiculous. You can't sit still for a minute. Mm. And uh, you don't want to be known as an old guy. You want to be known as somebody who keeps on knocking at the door <laughs> and giving it a go. You know? <laughs> but this, it's, it's the one, it, oh, the young guy um, from Nor from Norway, or oh, is it Sw some Sweden, uh, uh, Barnard Kolstad. Okay, it's a new one. Yeah, these are yeah. all new. A lot of fifty percent of these are new names on me. I'm getting a, getting yeah, a bit behind here. Sharpen up, sharpen up. Still, still listening to Gad and Vinny. <laughs> yeah, oh no, me too, me too. Oh, um, uh, so. Steve, uh, I love Steve Gad. You know, he's been a great friend over the years, and um, yeah. I, um, I rehearse in a town called Rochester, upstate New York. Hometown. And Steve Gad's brother still lives in the town. He's the local hairdresser. Hairdresser, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, yeah, brilliant. Uh, oh, it's, it's, um, well, Carl, last, the you... last time I saw Steve was at your event, at the um, that event last time well, you I... did, it was in Northampton, I believe. Yeah, well, we've been talking about doing another one of those events. I'm not quite sure if it'll be with a big band, but um, yeah. the great thing is now, I mean, certainly up until very recently, all these guys, you know, were, were playing lots in London. You know, Steve is at Ronnie Scott's very often, or at least yeah. he was. Uh, I think yeah. he'll probably be back before the end of the year. So um, yeah, I want to try and organise that. That concert was amazing. In fact, the yeah. footage is still on YouTube. If anyone's interested, that's good. That's nice. Yeah. So we've got four four parts on on YouTube. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so what? Is, so you've got the tour coming up. You've got the European tour happening. Hopefully, all being well. Possibly um, in September, if not November. And if it's if it's not safe. Um, because you know I've got to, as you know I've got a little bit of a heart condition so I have to be a bit careful if it's not safe we'll push everything into 2021 and then I'll celebrate the 50th anniversary of ELP through 2021 22 mm. and then by the end of 2023 the um, the radar film of Carnival 9 mm. will be out so there'll be a lot to celebrate and play in yeah. over the three years so I've got no plans on retiring I was going to ask that question would you ever retire from playing I mean 
what am I going to do here? You know, I can't retire. You know, it's a lot of everyone says it's the only thing Kate. that I, I I know. It's not that with me. If I wake up and don't play drums during the day, mm. you know, every day somewhere, then you know, I feel what's gone wrong. You know, there's something missing. You know, yeah. um, I just love yeah. it still. I just love it. I yeah. just love it. And poor, poor old Katie will have you at home then for. Well, you know, so I mean, you're she's still not driving. That pleased. Well, she, she loves it. <laughs> me being at home you know and uh, I enjoy being at home to a certain extent but you know uh, my place is behind a drum set yeah. that's where I need to yeah. be sitting so you can always come out and visit yeah <laughs> and have you, so you're going to go off are you pre, have you done your practice today I mean I've done a couple of hours already on the drums but I've, uh, I've done about an hour today I've been playing some hand drums today I've been trying uh, to get that some some stuff together yeah and I've been I've been you know you know this kind of thing where you play where, you know, that's the stick technique, you know. Mm. But then if you bring the fingers in. Oh, yeah, yeah, get the speed up. You know, you get the turbo thing happen. <laughs> I've been doing a bit of that, you know. So, yeah, no, I'm there, yeah. I'm there. The afterburners. I'll, I'll do the feet myself. I have to leave my feet till the afternoon because if I've just been for a run, I can't come back and play double bass drums. Really? I'm a bit tired. I'm a bit tired. <laughs> <laughs> I eat <need> food. <laughs> 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 oh, hey Carl, listen, thank you so much for doing this. It's been great. You're so, welcome, Ian. Yeah. Keep it up and um, I hope it gets bigger and bigger for you. And all the guys looking in, you know, just keep checking this stuff out because this is where it's at. Yeah. Oh, bless you, Carl. Listen, we'll speak a bit later on anyway. And okay. uh, but thanks for thanks for dropping by and uh, let's let's chat later. But it's an absolute pleasure. We'll catch yeah. you later. Thanks so much. Okay. <laughs> thanks, See Carl. Ya. Cheers. Bye. Mm. Fantastic. So that was definitely a, uh, a special moment. So um, I'm just going to turn Carl off there. So yeah, that was definitely a, um, a special moment. So um, can you see me? Yeah, great. So um, ah, really, really um, on a massive high after that. Thanks everybody for joining me. Amazing. So um, I'm going to be um, back next Monday to do my live stream on my own where I'm just going to be playing some more drums, talking and uh, just generally having a conversation. That's Monday at three o'clock. Um, I'm doing my masterclass then uh, next Wednesday. Um, week. Uh, so yeah, I can't remember what the date is now, but it's so next Wednesday uh, if you're interested at three o'clock. And then the following Friday, um, I'm doing my afternoon chat with... Um, the fabulous Johnny Thurkle. Um, if any of you guys know of Johnny, he's a fantastic, probably the country's most recorded trumpet player. He played on um, practically, look at it, look at his uh, Wikipedia page. He's played on practically every um, uh, single that's had uh, trumpet on it from about 1984. And in fact, his uh, original gig was the uh, Buddy Rich Big Band who we were talking about earlier on. So, hey, listen, thanks everyone for coming to um, for check this out. It's been um, it's been a fantastic afternoon. I'm uh, a little bit emotional, actually. So, um, but listen, wishing you a fantastic weekend. Have a great weekend and uh, come back and join me on Monday where I'll play some more and we'll do a bit of talking and uh, a bit more talk about drums. And uh, that's where we're at. So... Listen, have a good one. Great to see you. Sending lots of love to you and your families. Keep well, and um, I'll catch you next week. Bye for now.